Uh, my name is Greg Stiegel. I'm the Operations Director for Renewable Energy Alaska Project. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Denina people, past and present. REAP works throughout the state of Alaska. We recognize the indigenous lands that all Alaskans live and work on. We acknowledge this as thanks to the Denina people and all the indigenous peoples who have held relationships with these lands for generations and continue to be stewards of it. So yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, this is the last installment of our energy speaker series for the fall. Um, we've had a great lineup of events so far. Um, and yeah, thank you for making it for the last one. Uh, we'll be doing another round in the spring, so keep an eye out for that. Um, before jumping into tonight's event, I just want to give a little uh, rundown on REAP and who we are, in case we have any Newcomers here, uh, we, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based here in Anchorage, and we have a satellite office in Juneau. Um, half of our staff does STEM education, so first and foremost, we're doing uh, education primarily in K through 12 classroom visits. Um, we also do teacher trainings and some summer camps and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, big focus of, of ours is teaching uh, about renewable energy through science, technology, engineering, and uh, uh, we also host the Alaska Network for Energy Education and Employment, uh, and that's a program that's designed to connect K-12 education with vocational training and or university education, and then ultimately career paths and clean energy. We also work uh, on advocacy and outreach issues um, through policy initiatives, uh, and some lobbying. We've got a kind of a, a wide variety of things we're working on. I just want to highlight a couple that are at the forefront of our efforts right now. Uh, the first is the Rail Belt Electric Grid. We've been working with the utilities between Homer and Fairbanks to better unify the grid. Um, and we believe that this unification, if, if we can uh, get all the utilities talking together more uh, unanimously, we'll be able to uh, more efficiently share electricity up and down the grid, uh, ultimately making space for more renewable energy. Uh, the other area of advocacy that we're working on is designing a green bank for Alaska. Uh, green banks are uh, investment banks that are designed to leverage a small amount of public money with a larger amount of private dollars, um, specifically towards clean energy projects, um, and they can vary in scale, they can be anything from residential efficiency projects up to larger commercial projects. Um, so this, again, is a way that we think we can, uh, is the path forward uh, in funding clean energy projects throughout the state. There's a couple of green banks around the country that are working really well, and we've been working with the leaders um, in, the, in the nation on green banks to figure out how we can bring one here to Alaska. Um, and then, yeah, lastly, you know, for the outreach side of things, we like to host these public events. This is the last installment of our speaker series. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do the public outreach like this without the support of our sponsors. So I just want to name our sponsors for the speaker series quickly. Um, we've got two leading sponsors, BP and the Municipality of Anchorage Solid Waste Services. And then our supporting sponsors are the Alaska Center, the Denali Commission, Siri. Chugach Electric Association, and Doyon, and then Anchorage Museum is an in-kind sponsor. Uh, if you want to catch up on the other events that we had this year, uh, we had everything posted on our Facebook page, uh, video feeds from the events. So we started the season talking about electric vehicles, then we held an event uh, called Building a Clean Energy Economy. Um, we held an event in Fairbanks about uh, paths to cleaner electricity in Fairbanks, and we can mimic that event here in Anchorage talking about the Rail Belt Electric Grid. Um, so all those events, and this one as well, will be posted online. So feel free to check those out and share them with anybody who you think might be interested. Um, one last housekeeping item. We are in the museum, and it's open to the public now. They are going to have a uh, closing announcement. Um, speakers be warned, it's, I think it's around 6 o'clock. So there'll be a loud announcement on the loudspeakers here. Um, so yeah, on to tonight's event. I'm super excited uh, about our speakers and what we're going to be hearing about. Um, I will keep my introduction short here and give plenty of time. Um, we're going to hear two presentations. 
and there will be a little bit of time after each presentation that you can ask some questions for the speakers, and then we'll have a, a general question and answer session at the end as well. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, feel free to, to raise your hand after uh, the, the speaker's done with their presentation and pass the mic around so we can um, make use of this. So yeah, so uh, first we've got Levi Kilcher will be presenting. Uh, Levi leads the National Renewable Energy Lab's Ocean Energy Resource Assessment Activities. Through his work, his team seeks to characterize the opportunities and challenges of top-ranking tidal and wave energy sites around the nation. And that includes uh, Cook Inlet and the Gulf of Alaska. He completed his PhD in Physical Oceanography at uh, Oregon State University. And then after Levi, we'll be hearing from Nathan Johnson. Nathan is the Vice President of Development at ORPC. Nathan leads development activities and the implementation of its innovative power systems in cost-effective, environmentally responsible ways. He builds strategic partnerships and projects to accelerate new industries and strengthen communities. A native of Long Island, Maine, Nathan has a diverse background that includes renewable energy, commercial fishing, aquaculture, groundwater exploration and development, construction management, and environmental engineering. He graduated from Tufts with a degree in geology, and he is a main certified geologist. So I will leave it at that, and we'll hear from Levi first. So yeah, please welcome Levi up here. state and be able to talk about something that I'm really passionate about. Um, and it's really, a, it's also a great honor to be presenting alongside o ORPC. Um, they're really a, a global leader in this industry. Um, and, and I'm really excited to hear what they have to say as well. Um, this is a, this is a photo uh, taken this summer uh, for the, um, the, the commissioning of the ORPC Ridgen device in Igiagi, Alaska, and, and that's another event that I'm really honored that I was uh, invited to be a part of. Um, the, the, it was supported in large part, uh, to a large degree, by the U.S. Department of Energy, um, and, uh, and, but the work was really done by ORPC in the community of Igiagi, and um, I, I have to say that I had a relatively small part to pay and play in it, but I was really grateful to be invited to be a part of their, their, um, their event. So I want to start by taking a step back. Um, the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy's uh, Marine Energy Program is housed within the Water Power Technologies Office, which is part of the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office. Um, and so the Marine Energy Program uh, it sort of has, it sees itself as having a domain over wave energy, tidal energy, river sort of in-stream hydrokinetic energy, uh, the Igiagi project being an example of that, and then also um, ocean current energy, which is off the coast of Florida and Georgia. Um, sorry, I'm going to switch. Thanks, here. Just having to lean over that. Awkward. Um, and the the exact numbers, the values on this slide are not really important. The point is, is that there's a lot of energy. The U.S. has a large marine energy resource, but even more importantly for this talk, Alaska has an outsized proportion of that resource. We have 50% of the nation's wave energy resource. We have 90% of the nation's tidal energy resource. And we've got 20% of this uh, in-stream river resource. Um, and in addition, Cook Inlet, Alaska uh, is the number one site in the nation for tidal energy. I think uh, on, kind of on any metric that you look at, at these sorts of things, uh, Cook Inlet really stands out as a promising location for harnessing tidal energy. And so I think it's a really exciting thing. And, 
Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about it today. So, since I was invited to talk about tidal energy, I thought I'd start by talking about wave energy. Um, and I just, I just wanted to give you sort of this picture. Um, these are a bunch of different uh, wave energy devices um, that are sort of being actively developed or have been developed. Um, here on the far left is the Resolute Marine Energy Device. This is basically a flapping device that uh, sits on the seafloor and flaps back and forth as the waves go by um, and harnesses energy. Um, they had a, they've partnered with Yakutat in the past. Um, this buoy, uh, the OPT power buoy, it basically bobs up and down and generates uh, power uh, that way. Uh, this is a, the Palamis device. This is a European device. It's sort of a snake that uh, sits on the ocean surface and um, by the relative motion of sort of the different pieces of the snake, it generates electricity. Um, the M3 wave device sits on the bottom and there's sort of a pressure differential <coughs> from, from one side of the wave to the other and it drives uh, fluid flow through this pipe and, and there's a little turbine in this pipe that generates electricity and then this wave dragging device the idea is you can't, I, I sort of cropped this photo to fit it in with all these other ones, but it's got these big arms that sit, that stick out like this. And it sort of tries to catch the waves and they, they, they're funneled into the middle here and then they sort of crash over the top of this barrier and the water uh, is caught in a basin uh, and, and then there's uh, the pressure differential so that, that basin is then higher, has a higher water level than the ocean around it and, and so that drives a flow through a turbine. Um, and the thing you might notice about this is that there's really a bunch of different concepts going on for how to generate electricity from waves. And the, the way that the industry sort of talks about that is that there, there hasn't been convergence on like some fundamental basic device types uh, in wave energy. And that means that the they see that, that as to the technologies relatively new. It's, it's, a, much, it's a more emerging technology um, than, for example, wind energy, which has converged on sort of an upwind, three-bladed rotor that we're all familiar with. Um, so if we compare that to tidal energy, um, I think we're, you're starting to see things that you're a little more familiar with. And, and here I've just got a picture of three different devices. Um, of course, the ORPC device, I don't want to steal too much of Nate's thunder here. Um, but this is their Ripton device, uh, getting ready to go in the water in, in Abiyagi uh, this last summer. Um, this is what we call a cross-flow device, so um, the turbines are, are oriented um, sort of crossways to the, to the inflow. Um, and then this is, a, this is another U.S. company, Verdant Power. They have a project they're planning to deploy in the East River of New York. Um, in the spring of 2020, they'll be deploying a similar device to this. Um, and then on the far right, I've shown um, a picture of a, a, a somewhat larger turbine. Um, this is the, um, I believe this is the Andritz Hydro Tidal Energy Device. The time is 5.45 p.m. and the Anchorage Museum will be closing in 15 I assume we don't have to leave. Please stop by the museum shop for authentic Alaska Native Park and local yeah. handmade crafts. Once again, the time is 5.45 p.m. and the Anchorage Museum will be closing in 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a 1.5 megawatt device um, and it was deployed uh, in Scotland in the Pentland Firth. Um, and so this device is, uh, you know, uh, 1.5 megawatts. That's comparable to the scale of the wind turbines that you see on Fire Island and so on and so forth. So. Um, uh, you know, in, in some sense, uh, the Europeans, some, some might say the Europeans are ahead of us in this, in this sector in terms of the size of their devices, um, but I, I, I like to think that we've got some, some really good tech here back in the U.S. as well. Um, but the point is, is that these turbines are things that we're familiar with. Uh, the technology is being demonstrated at scales that are meaningful and relevant and they're generating significant amounts of power. Um, and I think where we're at now is we're demonstrating that these technologies can be reliable for longer periods of time than just a few days or a few weeks. 
Uh, we want to show, we're at the point now where we, we're demonstrating that these can, technologies can produce power consistently for years at a time. And that's fundamentally different than wave energy, and that's sort of important for some of the discussions we'll be having later on, or I'll be having later on. Um, so, where are we at with tidal energy? Um, this is a plot that shows the cost of wind energy uh, between 1982 and 2012, so it's a 30 year period. Um, and I basically think that we're at the far left end of this curve uh, for tidal energy. Um, the costs are still relatively high for these devices. We still are just making one-off devices or, or, or just a couple at a time. Um, and I think this, what happened in the wind energy industry is that in order to come down to these low costs to where we're now, we're actually competitive with other forms, sort of conventional forms of electricity generation, is um, we, we had to scale up. Um, it's basically uh, economies of scale brought the costs of wind energy down. And in the case of wind, it was largely driven by um, incentives by the state of California and some federal incentives um, that really provided the capital to install a bunch of devices, break things, um, try it out, and, and eventually, you know, OEMs like Siemens and GE stepped in and started buying the technologies that were successful and they commercialized them and, and were able to make them into products that um, we're seeing today are, are competitive with, with uh, traditional forms of generation. Um, and you know, I, I'm often inspired by what I see in the wind energy industry. You know, I, I work at the National Wind Technology Center in, um, in Boulder, Colorado, and they often talk about how back in these days, Everyone thought they were crazy. Are we really going to be able to pull this off? Are we, is it, are we ever going to make significant amounts of power? Are we going to be able to offset the power that we're burning when we drive to work every day? Um, and now you look, and GE has recently announced a 12 megawatt offshore wind turbine. Um, it's, I think it's like 180 meters tall. It's almost two football fields tall. And, um, it's, it's just really inspiring, and I'd like to think that we can do something similar um, in, in tidal energy and wave energy. And um, so incentives and those, uh, you know, tax incentives and subsidies and those sorts of things, I think, are things that we should talk about and um, can certainly help. Um, but the Department of Energy has also been sort of trying to think out of the box a little bit about other ways that we can um, get the experience that we need with these technologies to push the, to push the industry forward. Um, and so they've sort of launched this initiative called Powering the Blue Economy. Um, and the blue economy is basically everything that happens in the ocean. And so there's all these statistics about up here about how fast the blue economy is expected to grow in the next 10 years and these sorts of things. But I really want to draw your attention to this uh, slide over here on the, your right. Um, uh, and the, the biggest thing that I want to draw your attention to is that um, they have this resilient coastal communities component of their Power in the Blue Economy initiative. And this is like, this is like the hottest topic at the DOE Water Power Technologies office right now. Um, and in particular, I've been having meetings with people about this resilient coastal communities and how do we engage with these communities and who are they and how are we going to you know, effectively engage with these communities so that we can both advance our technologies but also meet the needs of the communities that we're, that we're working with. Um, and I probably don't need to tell anybody in this room that Alaska has a lot of these kinds of communities that are, that are experiencing high energy costs and so, you know, DOE sees these high energy costs and they say, oh, maybe that's a market where, you know, our expensive technologies can step in and actually compete or bring the costs of energy down in these markets at the same time as we're getting those iterations that we need in developing our technologies. Um, and so, you know, the thing that's interesting about, the thing that's remarkable about, about this plot is that, so the red dots are communities that have costs of power that is above 50 cents a kilowatt hour. And this information is a little bit out of date. It's uh, 2013 data from the Alaska Energy Authority's uh, PCE 
um, report. Um, but I think the picture is basically still the same. A lot of these communities around Alaska have high energy costs, and the other thing you'll notice is that a lot of these communities are located on the coast, or they're located on rivers. And so I think these are the types of communities that DOE, I don't think, I know these are the types of communities that DOE is thinking about right now and talking about targeting as a part of this PBE initiative. Um, just really quick, a few of the communities that have sort of already uh, been a part of DOE's program. Uh, Yakutat, uh, as I mentioned earlier, have been, uh, have been working with uh, Resolute Marine Energy, um, and Scott's in the room, and good, good to have him here. He was, he was a part of that work. Um, that was a wave energy project. Oh, the other thing I should say is uh, this green is, is the wave energy resource. Um, and so this dark green you'll see is sort of um, down along the panhandle, and then also along the Aleutians is where the energy is most intense. And so that's why, in addition to the technology not being quite ready in the wave energy sector, um, the, the wave energy is also not concentrated where the population centers are in the state as well. So wave energy is not quite the same opportunity, in my opinion, as riverine and tidal energy is. Um, but in Yakutat, it's, it's really an exciting opportunity. Um, Igiage, uh, Nate, I don't want to steal this thunder too much, but they, they've really been a thought leader in the space of really pushing the envelope and being willing to take the risk of working with these emerging technologies. And, um, and, and they've been absolutely phenomenal to work with, um, and I'm sure Nate would say the same. Um, and then Falls Pass is another site. This is a tidal energy site in this case. Igiagi is a, a river site at the headwaters of the Fijak River. Um, Falls Pass is a tidal energy site. It's actually the first uh, waterway through the, through the Aleutian Peninsula, so it's right at the end of the uh, Alaska Peninsula. Um, and, and it's a really promising tidal energy site. Uh, yeah, and then last, Cook Inlet. Um, this, again, is the number one tidal energy site in the country. It not only, so Alaska, I said earlier, has 90% of the tidal, tidal energy resource in the nation. Cook Inlet has half of it. The nation's tidal, almost half of it. it, has, it ha Cook Inlet has half of the 90%, so it's nearly half of the nation's tidal energy resources right here. And the remarkable thing about that is for a lot of these other tidal hot spots, you might call them, these little spots that pop up with this bright blue color around Alaska, the population centers are relatively um, small in, in these locations, but Cook Inlet is right here. It's right where all the people live. It's right where the energy is needed most. And um, so in my mind, this is, you know, the fact that we have the resource located here right next to all the people um, makes it a really remarkable opportunity. This, uh, Theoretically, you could harness something like 18 gigawatts of power, which is almost 20 times uh, the, the load of the, of, of the entire rail belt. Um, and so you could, you could build a project that was some small fraction of, of the, uh, the block, some small fraction of this channel, um, and you could generate uh, hundreds of megawatts of power. Um, and, you know, tidal energy isn't always there. It's going to oscillate, as we all know, throughout the day. But if you couple that with some of the existing storage projects that we have in the state, um, such as Bradley, and um, I was talking to Mike earlier about um, you know, a battery storage project that's going to be coming online, uh, you start to think about the state of Alaska approaching renewables of like 80, you could start to have a conversation of Alaska approaching 80 or 90 or 100 percent renewable. And I just think that's remarkable in a state that has traditionally been an oil-based state. Um, and it reminds me of uh, Norway. Uh, Norway is a, a country that, you know, they took the, all their oil wealth and created a renewable energy system. And there's something like, I don't know, 90 or 100, something 80 or 90 percent renewable. Um, and we could do that here in Alaska. We could do it with tidal energy, and we could export that knowledge and the technologies that we develop here to the rest of the world that's looking, for, that, that need this technology and that have tidal energy resources. I think that's really exciting. I would love to be a part of making that happen. 
and I've been working, you know, I've been at Enron now for eight years, um, and throughout my time there, me and some of my uh, colleagues, my mentors, have targeted Alaska, and we've said, look, this is, this is where the resource is, this is, it all fits together, um, we've got the small communities where you could do some of the early projects, and I've been working to sort of get this message to DOE that, that Alaska is a place that we should be doing this, and they're finally starting to listen, and I think we, we, have, we have a really great opportunity here. Um, so now I just want to talk uh, briefly about some of the work that we'll be doing to sort of, we're getting started on moving this forward at the National Labs. Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is supposed to be uh, the, the forelands of, of Cook Inlet. And so this is, uh, if I were to draw this box, it would be right here. Um, and, and in this case, I'm plotting the tidal power density. So the dark spots are where, are where the, the currents are the strongest, is where there's the most energy. Um, in this case, I'm plotting a bathymetry, and so you're, you're seeing a deep channel here, um, but there's a somewhat smaller channel here, and if we look, uh, we look here right off of the, the east foreland, um, there's this really intense sort of tide rip that exists there. Um, there's a lot of energy right there. And so because that's right next to the Kiski, it's right next to the grid, this is sort of where we're looking, we're focusing our, our efforts first. Um, and so this is sort of a, a transect across that site. The colors here in these bars indicate, um, based on models, what we expect the, the most energy, the most energetic sites to be. And so it's, the, most of the energy is concentrated here. And so we're going to be putting these um, instruments in the water to measure the currents. Uh, we're going to be measuring uh, the turbulence in the water, uh, which is actually really important. Uh, in the early days of wind, they didn't account for turbulence in the wind in their designs, and they, uh, all their turbines broke. They just kept breaking turbines, and they couldn't figure out why. They're like, well, the wind, the wind speed is 20 meters a second. Why do our turbines keep breaking? And it's really the, the, you know, when you're riding on an airplane and you hit turbulence, you know how jarring that is, and um, maybe you have similar nightmares as me when you're experiencing <laughs> that. Um, and so the turbulence does that to, uh, to wind turbines as well. And so that was actually one of the big reasons that I was originally hired was my background in oceanography was in turbulence. Um, and so uh, measuring the turbulence is a big piece of what we do and what, what my, interest, my specific interest area was when I started out here. But um, <coughs> my role is growing and, and my team is growing. And so we're gonna be measuring currents, we're gonna be measuring turbulence, we're also gonna be measuring sediment. Um, we think that's gonna be really important in Cook Inlet. Obviously, these are glacially fed, it's a glacially fed inlet, and the, those fine-grained sediments, figuring out how to deal with those when you've got uh, bearings and seals and those sorts of things is gonna be, I think, a challenge at this site. Um, we're also gonna be measuring salinity and temperature and so on. Um, this is a plot that just shows some of the data that we get, um, the turbulence. Uh, so the, this top plot just shows the tidal amplitude. Uh, this second plot shows the currents. This is from, um, oh, I meant to say, sorry. Attention, museum patrons. The time is 6 p.m. and the Anchorage Museum is now closed. Once again, the time is 6 p.m. and the Anchorage Museum is now closed. Thank you for coming, and we hope you visit again soon. All right. Um, um, we're going to be making these measurements in the spring of uh, next year, uh, in April of 2020. We're going to be going out. We're going to be putting three moorings at these three sites. We're also going to be making transects back and forth across the site to measure the flow and sort of try to capture that spatial variability at this site. Um, so I'm really excited to do to be to be doing that work, and we're partnering with ORPC and uh, Terrason here in Alaska. Has been, is going to be helping us a bunch with that work, as well as um, we're working with the, the RV Peregrine out of Homer, um, is going to be the ship that we're on. So I'm uh, really excited about this, this work. Um, yes, I believe I referenced this. This is mean lower low water here. Oh, you're, you're saying this? Oh, yeah, I, I don't remember exactly. Yeah. 
good question. Uh, I, I, I think I'm saying the same thing here. So I'll look at that again. Um, yeah, so these are the currents. This is the turbulence that we've seen at other sites. So this is just an example of the kind of data that we get. Um, I've said enough about that. The other thing I wanted to say is frequently when I talk about tidal energy, people will ask me, well, are you going to kill all the fish? You know, aren't those things just sushi makers? Or uh, what about, you know, and I think in Alaska, in Cook Inland in particular, the beluga whales are a real concern. Um, and so, uh, this was work that was done at the Pacific Northwest National Labs. So this is another one of your national labs uh, that's working in this sector. And they've done a lot of work. And you know, to cut to the chase on this is that a lot of these types of concerns, I think, are going to end up not being big issues. What, we, what they've found so far is that fish tend to avoid turbines. Um, we, haven't, we haven't had a scenario yet where a whale is encountering one of these devices to my knowledge but they've done some really interesting work where they've like taken blubber from a whale and they sort of modeled the structural strength of a whale's uh, I think in this case they were looking at a killer whale about the strength of its bone and its head and so on and then they said oh well, let's try to simulate what if you whack this thing with one of these tidal turbine blades and they found that it's not going it, to most likely it's not going to break the surface it's going to give the, the whale a headache maybe, but it's not going to do significant damage. And um, you know, so I think there's more work to be done um, in terms of uh, in this space, certainly. And we want, and, but the point is, is that we're looking at it. We're trying to be proactive about this. But all of the research so far indicates that these things are, are really, I, I think, not concerns. And, um, they're doing really great work at PNL. Lastly, so sort of bookending my talk here, starting with wave energy, ending with wave energy. Um, this is a wave energy, uh, wave, sorry, not wave energy. This is a wave measurement buoy. So this buoy is just measuring the waves in the Gulf of Alaska off of Kodiak. This is just putting more examples of the kind of work that we're doing to get a better picture of the marine energy resource that Alaska has. Um, the east and west coast of the US is sort of littered with these buoys. There's lots of data. The Gulf of Alaska is relatively sparse in terms of wave measurement buoys. And so we're trying to add to that and, and get a better picture so we can validate our models better and just really understand what the resource is. So I want to close with this slide because I think it really emphasizes um, the opportunity that we have here. Um, you know, DOE, like I said earlier, DOE is really shifting, I shouldn't say shifting their focus, but they have this new initiative that is a big topic at the Department of Energy, and especially this remote communities, resilient communities, how are we going to, how are we going to partner with remote communities uh, to advance our technologies and also hopefully help um, these remote communities, and I think Alaska is, is a, is, has the communities that they're looking for. Um, and I think one of the big questions that's been coming up in this space lately is, what's the right time to engage with these communities versus in terms of, you don't want to go talk to the community too early before you have something that you're ready to bring them. Because they'll just be like, well, why are you wasting my time? I want to get back to fishing. Um, on the other hand, you want to engage with them early enough that you can build, a, build the right kind of relationship and, and build the trust that you need to, to see these types of projects through to the end. And, um, and, and that's a big kind of question that we have right now. And I think ORPC has really been a model for how to do this in, in their work in, in Agiage and False Pass. Um, and my, my argument has been that we, we should really be identifying a relatively small set of communities early on to work with um, that are interested in, that are willing to sort of be the guinea pig. Um, but in general, we shouldn't kind of be launching a big initiative before we've demonstrated our technologies a little bit, a little bit more in this tidal and river energy space. We want to know that these devices, we want to be able to say, we've run these devices for two, three, five, 
years and know that they're really working. Um, but more importantly, that's just my opinion, and I'm interested to know what your thoughts are on this. I also I want to know what you guys think about Cook Inlet um, and the prospects there. What do, what do the utilities need to know about the resource and what the in a, about what the output profile of these technologies is going to be? Um, I feel like I've done all I can. I shouldn't say I've done all I can, but I've done as much as I can to get Alaska on the radar of DOE. And it's sort of on all of us together now to capitalize on that opportunity and figure out how to make the most of it. Um, so that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. And thank you for your time. ran up against was the 50 ton icebergs that are neutrally buoyant that break loose at high tide uh, after accumulating sediment in the intertidal zone. That would crush just about anything you could put out there. And in Igaduk, it's been taken out in the winter. So you really are not only on the high end of the renewable energy scale, but you're now twice as expensive because you can only amortize it for half of the year. So I'm sort of wondering just how far down the inlet you have to go to avoid the, the, uh, the neutrally buoyant icebergs so that we could actually put something in the water and unfortunately the current isn't strong enough on the, near the mouth of the inlet. Once you get south of the forelands, your, your current drops off considerably. And so do we really have any opportunity to, to field something that can work year long and not get clogged by ice or clobbered by ice? Um, so I've heard, uh, I've heard rumors about this submerged ice problem with, that, that's impregnated with um, sediments. But I've searched the literature and I haven't found anything that that definitively shows that it's there. And I'm not saying it's not there, um, but I'm really excited because these, these, tech, these devices will see it. We're going to see it if it's there. And so I'm really excited to, be, to, have, to have some data that's going to maybe shed a little bit more light on, on this question. Of, you know, we're going to have, this, these are going to be in the water for two months. Um, we're going to be at three different sites. Um, and uh, I hope we I hope we don't see it to be completely honest but if we do see it I think it'll be really interesting and and how frequently it's seen how big they are uh, starting to starting to actually answer some of those questions is something that I'm really excited about doing with this project um, I just I noticed that in, in some of your slides the, the map slides uh, there wasn't a, a, a lot of detail in terms of tidal energy potential for southeast Alaska. Was, was Is that because there isn't enough natural tidal energy, or was it just uh, not thoroughly investigated? Um, southeast Alaska and uh, the Aleutian chain both have significant tidal energy. It just, it just doesn't show up on this scale. Um, you know, they tend to be these little, these little hot spots that be, between the, the squeeze points of channels and things like that. Um, and you know, Cook Inlet shows up at this scale a little bit. You know, you can see the dark blue spots here, um, but that's because it's so big. Um, and uh, but there is there is significant tidal energy potential both in southeast Alaska and along the pollution chain. Thanks, this is really informative. And I'm glad to see you're thinking about it ahead of time how to involve villages. And I think one way to come in earlier and that will benefit the project is to come in and say, what do we need to be aware of? What's the local knowledge? What are those things that you see might be challenging that we may not? And I think that's important for both sides. 
you, know, you asked for the utility perspective. Uh, there's submarine cables uh, currently across the inlet uh, outside of the very high current zones, and there's been some interesting experiences with those, you know, where the cable's almost been knotted up in uh, changing topography of the bottom of the inlet. It's also been problematic, and I'm just trying to imagine in a higher current area where it's neck down, how much that uh, profile will change and what's, you know, outside of neutral density ice, what sort of, sort of challenges that will present for getting the power from the turbine back to the uh, infrastructure on land. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess my perspective is that these, I'm not trying to say there aren't going to be challenges with doing this. Um, but I, you know, I think that Alaskans, they pride themselves on their um, self-sufficiency and their uh, sort of practical problem-solving skills. And, you know, things like um, how to get a cable out to these, these types of sites. You know, there's, there, obviously there's uh, all sorts of horizontal drilling technologies. Um, those sorts of things, you know, I mean, the other practical problems that I think about the sediments, you know, how do you design a better bearing or a better seal, those sorts of challenges, they're real. And, you know, I mean, I think there's jobs there, too, in terms of, like, launching research initiatives to tackle these problems. Um, and if we can tackle them and if we can prove, we can demonstrate that we can do these sorts of things, then that knowledge that we develop in this state can be exported to, to the rest of the world. Uh, the Yakutat project, was that a tidal energy experimental project? Or was that, that was a wave energy project. That was a wave energy, yeah. Okay. I'm just curious as to, do you see one or the other of these types of, of tidal machines being better than the other one that's kind of pulling ahead? Or, or are they all about the same level of development right now? Um, I mean, they're not at the same level of development, but I think it maybe it has more to do with the amount of capital that's been invested. You know, the, Europe, the Europeans have invested more in, in terms of capital uh, than we have today. Um, you know, I think the, the uh, horizontal axis turbine, let's see. So, we call this a horizontal axis turbine, and this is a horizontal axis turbine because the flow sort of flows along the, the axis of the device. Um, you know, that's that's the basic concept that's used in wind energy, um, and you know, these technologies are leveraging that that knowledge basically. But you know, I mean, I think this the cross flow device has a lot of interesting advantages in terms of um, being able to sort of the, the robustness of being able to anchor it. At, multiple ends as well as the aspect ratio I think is really ideal for shallow river environments. Um, you know, you've got this mop, this wide device that's, you only have one generator. Um, I don't know, I, I, I can't answer that question, I guess. It's, it's a little early. Are you folks working on the integration with the diesel plant part at for villages? Or are you going to like just go with what the wind turbine folks have come up with. Yes and yes. <laughs> um, I mean, we definitely are trying to uh, the, the, the grid integration, microgrid integration of renewables is a huge challenge. It's one that um, I've been, you know, intermittently interested in, and um, uh, I am still interested in. Um, NREL has, has put a lot of, um, uh, you know, put a lot of heads together on that. But I, you know, I also think that's a case of, you know, Alaskans have, have been leading, leading this charge in terms of figuring this out because it's such an important issue for so many communities around the state, and it's it's at the fore. You know, every community that tries to integrate renewables has has to deal with that, and um, so 
that's a place where I sort of commend you all for your work in that space as much as, as NREL and, and other, other national labs that have been working on that Levi, um, there was a tidal energy workshop held in Ketchikan in 2007, and Bert Power was the keynote speaker there, Trey Taylor, I think was the guy's name. Um, I'm curious, it's interesting to me that Burton Power has a similar machine in the same place 12 years later. Can you say anything about what's happened over that period of time? Did they disappear for a while, or have they just been making it better and better? No, I, as a uh, lab, uh, it's an uncomfortable question for me to answer, but um, yeah, I mean, they have been developing the design. I would say that there was a there was a slow spot in in the DOE uh, when the when the administration changed basically, and there was there was lots of questions about funding, and that I think that slowed things down for a little while. Maybe one more question for Levi, and then uh, we'll transition. So Levi, we have a, a resource that's gigawatts, right? And yet, the machines that we have are kilowatts, maybe low megawatts. So, so what do you see as the, the bridge? How do we how do we get there? Is, is it just demonstration projects, and, and then scale it? How, how do you see us getting to to the bigger scale? I mean, um, I, I mean, I think that these types of innovative approaches, like the Power and Blue Economy Initiative, and um, um, just ways to get repetitions with deployment projects and test projects, and I think it also requires doing testing at, you know, at labs, and I don't necessarily mean national labs, I mean universities and places where we can test components of the devices and make sure the device is robust enough before it goes in the water so that when it goes in the water, you know, at maybe a megawatt scale, we're not trying that for the first time. Um, uh, but it's, I guess I would just put this plot up here and you know, as a lab employee, I'm not really supposed to talk about policy. <laughs> but I'll put this plot up here and point to the subsidies <laughs> and incentives <laughs> that helped commercialize land. Great, thank you, Levi. Um, yeah, give Levi a big hand. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very much Convey is what we're up to now over the last uh, couple of years in advancing our technologies. So a little bit of background on ORPC. I think a lot of folks in the room know about ORPC. We were founded in 2004. We have approximately 30 employees. We're headquartered in Portland, Maine. Um, so both myself and my colleague Harry, who's here as well, um, work out of the Portland office. Um, we also have offices in uh, Montreal, Canada, and Dublin, Ireland. Um, and we do have staff in Alaska as well. Um, our company is founded around our core technology that, that Levi explained, our cross-flow technology. Um, and in addition to that, I would say that um, we have a very, very strong development team. So coupled with our technology development, we have staff that really are responsible for making sure we get the, the technology in the water in ways that are environmentally, economically, and socially appropriate for the sites. And we do that by really developing very strong relationships with the communities that we work with. Um, where, in fact, these are their projects where we work uh, as much as ours, um, and they're as much part of the success, if not more, um, as us. Um, we recognize, uh, as uh, Levi really explained very well, 
Um, there's a significant market in Alaska, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail about our focus. But we see very similar markets as well in northern Canada and southern Chile and Patagonia um, related to the diesel high cost um, markets. So a bit of background on some of the work that we have done in uh, Alaska. Um, you've heard a lot about the Igiagi project, uh, which is here. Um, but we've done previous work um, on the tidal energy side, both in Nikiski and Anchorage. Uh, we have a project in Falls Pass that I'll uh, explain a little bit further, um, as well as some early testing on in the NANA. Um, the Kodiak and Yucatan are both actually um, projects that our development team were involved with. Kodiak um, with uh, actual Levi's team in deploying that uh, wave energy or wave measurement buoy. And Yucatan actually we worked on some permitting for that uh, Resolute Marine um, wave energy device. So a, a book, big uh, footprint, uh, none of that would be possible without some great partners, uh, both on the state and federal level for funding, um, as well as other partners within the state that have really been uh, a big part of our success. Um, the market, uh, so this is really the driver for us, and I think it really builds off what Levi was talking about. Um, there's over 700 million people in the world um, that use diesel generation for their source of power. In Alaska, that's uh, 78,000 people um, and over 27 million gallons of uh, diesel that get burned annually. Um, that results, especially in a lot of these very remote locations, to very high cost of power. Um, a lot of these communities are indigenous communities. Um, and then, as Levi showed, most of them are located on some sort of uh, water resource, whether it's a river, tidal resource, or wave resource. Um, and that results in these island grids um, and um, because of those combined conditions, we're really focusing on this market. So I'm going to spend some time talking about Igiagi today in a little bit more detail. Um, my former colleague Monty um, spoke to this group, uh, regroup, about a year ago in October and teed up this project. So I thought it would be really helpful to kind of uh, give you an update on where we've been um, since that time and uh, give you some real highlights of uh, how this came together over the course of this year. Uh, so again, Igiagi is a community, uh, it's about 250 miles southwest of Anchorage. Uh, amazing community with amazing leadership and amazing vision. Um, in addition to recognizing the need for more sustainable um, energy solutions, uh, they're also looking at other innovative ways to really sustain their community. Um, great leadership. Um, this, uh, this community is actually located on one of the highest concentrations of sockeye salmon in, in the world. Um, and so that's something that we work very closely with them because of the importance both to subsistence as well as um, commercial fishing in the Bristol Bay area. Um, so I'm going to talk kind of about the journey of our device, our rigid device. Um, this is uh, an iteration of our device. We actually deployed um, previous generations in Igiagi in 2014 and 2015 which really allowed and formed this latest design, which is a modular system really intended to use minimal equipment so they can be shipped and uh, deployed using local assets. So uh, this picture actually shows uh, Governor Janet Mills um, in Maine. Um, as I said, we're based in Maine, and uh, we actually assembled the unit um, in a hangar at the former Brunswick Naval uh, Air Station uh, in, over the course of the winter. So dry fit everything. The components came from a number of different places. Um, we tried to build as uh, locally as possible. The, the structure that we call the pontoon support structure um, was actually built uh, in Maine, as well as all the other structural components. The generator itself um, uh, comes from a Norwegian company. Um, this figure doesn't show the mechanical brake, but that actually comes uh, as a British company. And the turbines themselves um, are, were built in Ireland. Um, they were shipped directly to Igiagi. Uh, this shows a few more pictures of assembling the device uh, inside of Maine, even though it's uh, nice and inside. Uh, in the wintertime, it was still kind of chilly in that hangar, um, and uh, so guys were bundled up. Um, in fact, this is one of our employees from Alaska um, who was in Maine for the winter to, the, to help with the assembly. Um, and then once that was, uh, we went through, integrated everything, it was um, broken down, shipped by a flatbread trailer across the U.S., um, and uh, then by barge across Cook Inlet. Um, 
over the past to Lake, Lake Eliamna, um, and then on the barge here, uh, arriving in Ikiagi. Um, I think you can see it didn't show up too well here on the chart, but uh, this is Cook Inlet here, um, and uh, it was actually shipped across the Williamsport um, to Lake Eliamna. Um, at the same time, I, I really want to highlight, um, I think a lot of folks in the room recognize that, uh, the importance of this. Um, we uh, were able to secure the FERC license on behalf of the Igyak Village. They're actually the license holder. Um, and uh, this is a significant deal. It's the, the uh, first FERC license for a hydrokinetic device that's actually being held by a tribal entity. Um, and then once operational, this is actually the first operational river hydrokinetic unit in the U.S. Um, uh, under a FERC license. Um, and in addition to FERC, we had all these other federal, state, and local permits that were required, were required as well. Um, and uh, Carrie, who's in the back of the room there, was really instrumental um, in making sure we achieved these uh, goals, um, very significant goals. Uh, this is a 10-year pilot license for the ADI project. A um, little bit more lay of the land um, in Igiagi. So um, this is the main village here. Um, this is actually a, a showing our ribbed end device on shore where it was assembled when all the components got there. Um, and then this is the mouth um, to the Quijack River that uh, winds down here. The project site is actually just um, past this small uh, island. And then the power comes to shore um, and gets integrated into the, the local grid. Uh, this is a picture of some of the reassembly in Ikiagi. Again, um, the, the device is designed to be modular so that um, all the components can be lift, lifted using just local assets, um, which is really important, uh, not only for Ikiagi, but also for, um, for a number of other communities like Ikiagi in Alaska or elsewhere. Um, most of this integration assembly um, occurred within the course of about two weeks, um, late, late June and early July. Um, and again, highlighting the local equipment. Um, this is a, a salmon vessel, a um, Bristol Bay vessel that they have in Ikiagi that was used for most of, uh, most of the sh uh, pushing the device around. Local vessels using for uh, support and safety vessels, um, and then uh, the on onshore equipment as well. Um, this is a picture showing the deployment of the Dragon Bedman anchor. This is actually a, a Norwegian Rybop anchor. Previously on our deployments, we had used some custom anchors, uh, two, two anchors. Um, we went for this down to a single dragon bedman anchor that's bridled back to the device. I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, and then this is actually launching the device into Lake Iliamna. Um, once it was in Lake Iliamna, we take um, testing and safety very, very importantly. So we did a number of tests, making sure that um, this device could be pushed by the vessel, with adequate speed that it can be controlled going down the, uh, the river, but also um, submerging the device and bringing back to the surface, making sure that all elements of uh, the system work well. Um, and then on the shore, um, this is uh, the deployment site. If you're, this, uh, this photo extended to the left is right down, down the stream of this um, right here. This is the shore station, so it's a modular system. Um, it's actually it's the same shore system that we had used previously, so that houses all the equipment from going to, from the turbine device into the local grid. Um, and again, it's using an existing gravel um, road there. Um, and then the, the device itself was uh, moved from the lake to the deployment location that shows that um, vessel um, actually going downstream with the device, controlling it. Um, the way that this is designed is it floats on the surface using the pontoons. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I think, the same photo that Levi has shown. Um, this is once it actually gets hooked up to that anchoring system that I showed. So um, this current is roughly two meters per second consistently. And, uh, and so it's, again, taking safety into account. Um, we're very cautious about making sure we work safely uh, for our crew and the local crews. Uh, once on site, um, final maintenance check, uh, and then we install it. So um, the way this works on the installation is those pontoons are um, ballasted, um, actually one side at a time. I'll show you a quick video of what that looks like. Um, and then it uh, sits on the riverbed, 
completely out of sight, below the surface, um, below the draft of local vessels. Um, and again, I want to highlight, um, you know, these are uh, local uh, folks from API that were absolutely instrumental in, in all these activities. Uh, you know, some of the, the best trained folks globally in the industry are actually located in API. Uh, they do tremendous work. Um, so here's a quick video um, showing the device on station. Uh, this is uh, a barge that was used to uh, uh, house the cable uh, as the cable was brought to shore. Um, and then this shows uh, the device actually being installed and submerged. That process takes uh, roughly about an hour and a half to submerge the device. Um, and it's about the same um, uh, when we bring it back to the surface. Uh, that's an aerial photo from a plane um, showing the fully submerged device. On the surface there are just uh, some surface marking buoys for navigation, both downstream of the device as well as the anchor here. Um, so uh, this is just the first step um, in this project. That device um, actually will be in the water all winter. The intent is to operate that um, annually um, throughout um, all seasons. Um, we've done work to characterize the ice conditions um, in that river to understand the surface ice when it breaks up in Lake Iliamna. Um, and we'll do some additional on-device uh, monitoring this winter as well um, to really characterize that. So the intent is for this device to operate 12 months a year um, consistently. Um, and it's uh, really unique when it comes in terms of renewable energy because it's a baseload source um, consistently sending power to the local grid. The next step for us um, is really to um, integrate smart grid controls, energy storage, and a second device, which will allow the community to reduce their diesel use by 90% and really regulate that those existing diesel generators to backup only. Um, and uh, we were very pleased working on behalf of the village council um, that we uh, uh, were awarded um, just this year uh, through the DOE Indian Energy Program, which is different than the Water Power uh, Office, uh, funding to do this phase to this project. So that's very significant. Uh, and uh, it's very much aligned um, with what Levi was talking about in terms of resilient communities. And that was really the program that DOE and Indian Energy was really um, interested in. Um, and getting a little bit more into details on that, um, this is kind of the model that we see that's replicable from uh, the API microgrid. Um, we see this as baseload renewable energy um, that has, uh, will result in significant decreases not only in diesel use but CO2 emissions, O&M costs from their existing and environmental risk. I mentioned that this community is actually located on the highest concentration of sockeye salmon and they fly in diesels, uh, diesel to the community which is a huge risk to that resource. Um, out of sight, no noise, um, lots of uh, advantages to that. Uh, this schematic kind of shows how this works as an ecosystem where um, we think our technology can act as a base load that enables other technologies, other renewables to come on to that system um, and also make sure that, um, that critical um, infrastructure are supplied by power. Um, we're also working with the community on a lease structure so that we can offer them, as well as other communities, um, this solution uh, at uh, or below what they're currently paying, um, instead of coming up with the capital costs up front. So that same model is something that we're looking at for tidal environments, and the false pass I'm going to talk about briefly. Um, Levi mentioned false pass. It's, uh, it's a community that has an incredible resource. Um, we've actually done work there characterizing that resource, and it's one of the best that we've ever seen anywhere. Um, they do have high cost of power, not as high as uh, Igiagi. Igiagi is almost closer to a dollar kilowatt hour. Uh, false Pass is uh, closer to 40 cents. Um, so this is, uh, this is a community we're very interested in. Um, and just recently, um, this year, and we're just kicking this off right now, um, we were awarded a uh, SBIR, a Small Business Innovation uh, Research Grant for False Pass. I'm going to talk briefly about what that entails. So what that really is to look at is, again, the, the community scale microgrid like we've done for Igiagi, but incorporating tidal energy into that system. 
title's a little bit different. Um, a, uh, unlike river energy, it's, uh, it's intermittent, but it's completely predictable. So um, this resource is, again, a, a significant resource. When you couple that with energy storage, you can create a base load energy source. And that's really the intent of this um, phase one. Phase one of any SBR is really focused on feasibility. So it'll enable us to, to look at that tidal resource. We're actually going to be deploying some instrumentation on um, their power system to really monitor uh, and get a better idea of their energy usage. And then based on that, look at um, the economics of integrating a, a, a grid around tidal energy with the intent, hopefully, uh, to proceed and ultimately um, deploy a turbine. So what's next for us? Um, you know, we're really looking at um, using what we've done in Igiagig and what we continue to do in Igiagig to uh, identify other communities in, uh, in Alaska and around the world um, where we can deploy our technology. So a lot of our focus, especially on the development side, is looking for those opportunities, looking for that market where we can really make significant contributions uh, again, not only in the economics, but in the social and environmental benefits that can result from our technology. Um, and really start engaging with those customers to build relationships, which takes time. Um, and really um, using, again, that API project um, as, as a terrific model. Um, these photos are actually from, from some of the site work we did um, over uh, the course of the summer, uh, August time frame, up on the Yukon River, looking at other communities there. Um, that uh, might be uh, interested in this type of technology. So with that, um, again, really appreciate your time and interest, and we'd be happy to uh, um, answer any questions. How far below the surface do you have to deploy that to avoid freezing it in, and have you ever survived the break? So um, it's a good question. So uh, in Igiagi, the um, I'll, I'll start with the second one. This is the first winter um, that we'll be going through, so we haven't gone through the breakup yet. Um, however, we deployed um, instrumentation called a shallow water ice profiler to look at the depth of the ice that comes out um, of Lake Iliamna in that deployment area. And um, the, what we have measured um, is less than the draft of over the device. So over that device is about four and a half feet of water, um, and we saw that the ice itself um, coming out is only a, a foot or two. Um, it's a bit of a unique situation in Alaska in API. It's a great first mover, early adopter site for several reasons. One of them being ice. Um, it's a clear river environment. Um, there's very low silt, but also the site itself doesn't freeze over. Um, the ice that comes down is when Lake Ileana breaks up. And so that's, um, we have a pretty good understanding of that, um, not only from our partners in the community, but also by deploying instrumentation to understand that. And we, we have done that <clears throat> over the last couple of years to, to, to get to that question, because it's a very valid question. A lot of these technology projects we see coming coming around Alaska is a long period of development, like a new technology. I'm kind of uh, curious to hear about uh, what kind of a business model we have to employ. I know it's partly funded by, by these different grants and community efforts, but uh, you have to have some outside resource to maintain this long period of funding to be able to develop the technology to get where you want to go. It's a great question, um, and uh, it's not easy. Uh, and, you know, we uh, there was a question about burden, and you know, it takes a long time uh, to develop not only develop the technology, but to go through the permitting licensing process uh, as well. Um, so we've been very successful um, in leveraging um, and combining private and public capital. Uh, that's part of it. Um, and uh, the other way that we look at this is we. Um, look at that, um, what we call our LCU reduction curve that Levi showed for wind, and use that as a way to determine where the early adopter markets are versus the next markets and the next markets. And as you bring your cost of your technology down, 
the markets become bigger and bigger. Um, and so uh, these high cost markets for us, we've really identified as those early adopter, early mover projects. Um, and what we are, as a company, which is very exciting for us, is, is we feel like we're in the transition from research and development to sales and service. Um, and once you start getting sales, then you can kind of wean yourself off of um, the, uh, the other government support and use it just for continued improvements in technology. And so there is a transition, it takes a very long time. Um, and, uh, you know, it was the same way in the wind, it was the same way in solar. Um, but we think by looking at their uh, cost reductions um, that we can um, do that um, as, as quickly or quicker than they are learning lessons from you know, their improvements as well. Sure. This goes back to cook, cook in the, in the high tile areas. Uh, I was uh, advised that uh, kind of like if you have an array in the water, that they can only be spaced so far apart because of the turbulence. And so it's kind of like one of these um, Oklahoma uh, land rushes, you know, gold rushes to get the technology in there to secure your space to be able to grab a certain kind of market share that, that meets your needs. And, Kind of address that. Yeah, sure. Question. Yeah. Um, so early on in the industry, I'm trying to think, um, 10 years ago probably, there was a gold rush on permits. Um, the um, And those are first preliminary permits for our industry. And um, what folks quickly found is the technology wasn't um, uh, advancing quick enough to keep up with those permits. Because those permits actually require pretty stringent um, reporting requirements and demonstration of progress towards a license um, and license submittal. Um, so unless you're really advancing um, on your understanding of, there's a number of different criteria, site conditions, resource, working with communities, um, then FERC will, you know, they, they, uh, they are pretty stringent on actually canceling those permits. Um, and enough time has elapsed. Um, that uh, a number of those permits, there's far, far fewer preliminary form permits than there are uh, today than there were previously. Um, in, in regards to um, the array, that's, um, those are considerations um, that we have. We actually have measured our, the wake effects of our device um, and we'll use that as well as other um, criteria to determine the appropriate spacing um, of devices. Um, when we look at tidal environments as well and kind of scaling up, um, we actually look at, because our systems are modular, uh, we are, we're actually looking at stacking devices as well. So not only can we um, extend the width, but actually extend the, uh, the height of the systems. And we have previously deployed a kind of a utility scale larger system in Maine. Um, we're working on the next generation of that. Um, and really learned a lot over the years um, in terms of different anchoring technologies how to deploy. We're actually looking mostly at um, systems that have what we call a buoyant tension warning system. So devices that are moored within the water column, still completely submerged, uh, and using that type of system to scale up in the tidal environment. Thank you. Yeah, I have two questions, please. Um, this type of uh, device that you have in the heat out, can you envision that being Expanded to the point where it would uh, be able to power an area of the size of Anchorage or the Matsu Valley. And also, with those blades, do you worry about belugas getting tangled up in them? I, I know fish could probably go sure. through them pretty easily. Yeah, um, so I'll start with the second question. Um, we actually refer to them as foils, not blades, um, for some of the optics, but um, because they're actually, they are designed after um, airplane foils, so they have a NACA profile. And, um, and uh, We've done uh, a significant amount of studies, um, environmental studies, uh, both for marine mammals as well as for um, fish. Uh, when we deployed in Nagiagi in 2015, it was actually, well, the sockeye salmon uh, adult run was still happening, and over a million and a half sockeye salmon passed that device going to Lake Iliamna, uh, and we did not see, and we have video monitoring systems uh, working with uh, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, didn't see a single uh, evidence of injury or mortality of single fish. Um, so um, that doesn't mean there's not no risk or any risk, but, um, but uh, we think it's pretty minimal. And 
Um, the system that we've deployed this year um, is uh, also has monitoring systems on it, um, video monitoring systems um, for that purpose as well. Um, so um, we, we're pretty confident. Beluga are very extremely rare in Iñagi. Um It's about 60 miles up from Bristol Bay. Um, and uh, that is certainly more of a concern in Cook Inlet, um, Beluga, especially the distinct population um, uh, segment. Um, and that actually has been, as we have looked at opportunities in Cook Inlet, um, have been, was one of the reasons why we're concentrating more around East Portland than up near Fire Island because of the presence of Beluga. Um, no indications that um, there would be negative uh, uh, attractions, but, um, but there certainly is more scrutiny around uh, when there's an endangered species for sure. Um, and then your first question was on scaling up to provide power to much larger uh, uh, customers. Um, we do think that uh, our devices are scalable. Um, that will take some time um, to um, get that technology to that point. Um, as I said, we are working on tidal power systems as well. Um, and then the other consideration, I think, for whether it's Anchorage uh, or other you know, larger utilities is making sure that that um, technology is introduced at a point on the cost curve um, that is appropriate. Um, so, you know, our, the early adopter markets are extremely high cost. It's really identifying, you know, when we can compete economically. Um, and we think that, that um, that's absolutely possible. Um, it's just a little bit further out than the remote communities. Can I have a follow-up question there? Sure. Can you, and, and maybe curious to hear me by chime in on this, just like I, ideal scenario, um, what like what what's the time frame like what steps need to happen for it to be kind of utility scale from each of your perspectives um, and like you know what's the next testing ground that you need to hit and, and what are some like kind of major milestones from your perspective and then from a re research perspective as well. Okay. Um, like, and like explicit time like are we talking decades are we talking you know what what kind of time sure. frame? Uh, I think that um, from a research research perspective starting now. Um, and trying to understand that there's, there's really both a, the, the, the resource site characterization work and then the economics. Um, and both those things need to align in order to deploy devices. Um, so the work that Levi is doing now is essential to really understand. Um, Cook Inlet, as some folks have kind of alluded to, is a complicated system. Um, and so trying to understand that system in more detail is going to allow companies like ORPC or other companies to understand um, you know, what is appropriate. What, where, where their technology is and when it's going to be appropriate. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions around, um, you know, the seabed geology. Um, you know, uh, that's one of the biggest challenges in the industry is um, there's no one, one size fits all when it comes to anchoring technologies um, for these environments. And uh, as a geologist, I'll say that I've been kind of surprised. You would think that a lot of these environments would be scoured bedrock or, or um, something like that because of the high velocities, but there's an incredible range of different um, seabed geologies in, in these locations. So uh, in some applications, gravity anchors may work. In others, it could be suction caissons or screw anchors or, or other types of technologies. And, and uh, So there's, there's a lot of different things to consider, as well as turbidity and, and other things that, uh, that Levi is working on. And then on the economic side, um, you know, again, it's, it's a matter of um, growing the scale. So, and that's one of our, you know, um, initiatives is to really um, work uh, uh, with the BridgeGen product and getting that out to communities and growing to scale, bring those costs down because that will be directly related to um, our title technology as well. Uh, and then in time frame, you know, I think that uh, uh, certainly not decades. Um, I would say, um, you know, considering also that there's a fairly lengthy permitting and licensing process, um, that I would say in a five to ten year time frame. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I would just echo everything he said. Um, the I was I was also thinking about just the research that needs to be done on the site and, and the geology. I mean, one of the things. Um, this was actually a, um, a, a bathymetry survey that uh, ORPC conducted was that in 2012. Um, and we actually recently purchased that data and we're 
putting it into the public domain now, and, and it shows that there are these large sand dunes sort of just up, uh, up the inlet from the, the foreland. And, and you can actually, when you sort of take, blur your eyes and take a bird's eye view, you can see how as the tide rips around that corner and you get these eddies, it deposits the sand um, on that upstream side. Um, but it is, it is away from the, from the channel where the, where the energy is most intense. But it does raise this question of if you start to slow the flow down in that site, are you going to see sediment de deposition in there that's going to be a problem for you? And I, I, I think we can, and, and so the um, sediment measurements that we're going to be making now to characterize what are the sediments that are in the channel are sort of a first step at us being able to say, okay, these are the sizes of the sizes and the mass properties of these sediments. Now let's run simulations where, where we put turbines into these sites and see if that sediment accumulates. So those are the sorts of things that we're starting to, trying to grapple with. But you know, I don't think that, again, I think it's a, these are technical challenges that we can solve. For example, maybe that means that you're going to use a floating technology rather than something that's anchored on the bottom, or you know, who knows what. But um, uh, and then as far as timeline, yeah, it's about scaling up. Um, I think I think we can do it in ten years if we if we make the commitment to do it. Um, and it, it's a you know it's about finding it's it's a chicken and the egg thing some point and um, I think it's about let's do it <laughs> yeah and I'd also say it, it's happening uh, and I think yeah. the IB is um, yeah, exactly. a, a good model for that it's 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 not uh, it's happening um, and it, it uh, might be happening slowly but um, every uh, every progressive step is going to be uh, really important to moving the industry to that bigger scale, um, and uh, so I, I think it's a really exciting time in the industry, not only for us, but there are other projects uh, happening um, in the U.S., um, both on the tidal and the wave energy front, um, that um, that I think over the next couple of years will bring further um, awareness to the industry, and uh, and with that, hopefully, bring a lot of other uh, more momentum. Yeah, and and I mean the Europeans have. You know, they have scaled it up to somewhat larger scales than us. Um, you know, we could take that uh, as a model or you know, develop partnerships. Um, uh, you know, I think all this is to be to chart. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I kind of put that on you guys to, to help us figure this out. Um, Fire Island has about 80 megawatts worth of wind sites left. <coughs> And their last profit was 6.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Do you think that because of you have a more predictable uh, production pattern that you are be given a premium? What is it and when will you reach it? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that because we haven't um, have anything negotiated for that. Um, certainly we think that there's, um, when it comes to capacity factor, um, there's advantage of, of tidal um, over wind. Um, it's, that's not discouraging wind, but um, you know I think that there's advantages of that. Um, certainly, the predictability, as you, you noted, uh, uh, is really important as well. Um, you know, there's never even been some folks um, we haven't explored it too much, but have talked that have talked about the sequencing tidal energy over the course of Cook Inlet. You can actually um, Pretty much create a base load energy source, um, and so that, in that sense, the capacity factor overall in the Cook Inlet would be very high. So I think there's advantages of that. We're not to the point where we've negotiated EPA or anything like that, uh, but um, you know, I think that there's a lot to be learned probably from the uh, Sure. Uh, so you um, the National Renewable Energy Lab and the Pacific Northwest National Lab, um, we have a MHK, what we call an MHK grid value project where we're actually trying to quantify the value of the predictability of uh, tidal energy um, in terms of like, you know, if, if you can rely on tidal energy 
you know, if you build a tidal energy project that this, that, that, that's this big, you know it's going to be available, and maybe that's, that um, the capacity of that uh, project is a half or two thirds of what an equivalent wind project would be. And so you can actually start to quantify what what the value of that predictability is, or maybe you, you, there's less batteries that you have to build into your system. Um, so quantifying it at so those macroeconomic scales is something that we're looking at. Um, I had a question about, uh, you said that you worked with the university to film the sockeye run and that you had a vice in the water. Did the fish actually <laughs> swim right through the glades of it? Um, the, uh, no, uh, for the most part, well, yes and no. Um, so uh, we've actually done a lot of work as well with fish um, in Maine. Um, that's been published work as well. Um, and uh, what we've tended to, to see from most of the data is that smaller fish go right through the turbine without any adverse effects, without actually hitting the, the foils. Um, and uh, the larger the fish, the greater the distance they start taking avoidance. Um, and uh, one of the good things about the technology is that fish you know, have developed over millennium the ability to avoid um, structure in the water, and so they tend to just avoid it. Um, in the case of sockeye, um, they uh, this kind of gets to pro appropriate siting of the turbines. Um, the sockeye tend to go up the banks um, because they're going upstream. They don't want to fight against the, the high velocity area. So by just where we are located within the river stream, avoids a lot of the interaction. Um, we did see some interaction with sockeye where they would approach the device and then just swim away. Uh, we did see some smolt, uh, other salmonoid smolt that went right through it, schools of smolt, um, with no noticeable adverse interaction downstream. Okay, thank you. I have another follow-up question. I know that there's a lot of uh, debate, I guess, on the sediment transfer and the debris transfer and how to mitigate I go back to, there's a lot of oil and gas development that's already taken place over the years. Uh, the North Seas have developed a lot of different technology, and that can all be integrated into the ocean energy projects also, I would think. And how much do we utilize that existing technology and tackle some of these engineering problems? Um, that's a very good question. So there's, there is a lot to be learned from um, other industries, um, I mentioned some of the you know the anchoring technologies. There's um, there's a lot of anchored um, oil platforms and other things that, that uh, um, the biggest challenge we've seen is that uh, the costs associated with oil and gas technologies and deployment are way outside of the uh, early budgets of the technologies that are involved in the NHK space. Um, so. Um, whether that's good or not, I think it actually leads to a lot of innovation um, within the space. So we've done a lot of innovating um, that I think, uh, a lot of lessons learned, but also a lot of innovation on how to do things um, in these very, very challenging environments, but how to do them cost effectively. Um, and so, yeah, I agree that, that there's absolutely a lot that can be learned, um, but it seems like the, the costs are uh, prohibitive a lot of the time in, in the early stage of the, the industry. I think we have time for just one more question here. Thank you. Um, this is perhaps a parochial question, but um, down in Homer, uh, there's the, I don't know, Rib Gen 1 maybe, or something that came out of the Big Yuk River, or the Kujak River. Um, I was just kind of sitting there. I was curious, I mean, one, what, what's going to happen with it? I don't know if it's still there or not, if somebody's taken it away. Um, but, and then a lot of questions came up, and, and so they were trying to find out oh, what happened with that. I mean, it was sort of put in the river, and then taken out of the river, and I guess taken apart or something, and not going to be used again. Um, I assume that was their second we're Gen 2 um, out there. So I was just curious if you could touch on what, what happened.
happened with the first experiment, how it obviously didn't go really well. Um, so I'm just curious what... Uh... Sorry. Um, well, I would actually consider that project is incredibly successful. Um, and, but I, that was, a, again, a DOE-funded project, so these have project lifelines, life, uh, lifetimes. Um, so that was the end of the project. Um, we kind of have set milestones to go through. Um, I'm actually not exactly sure of the status of those components in homework. Um, I know that uh, one of the turbines was actually brought up here to the museum last year um, and was on display um, at the museum, um, which we were pretty proud of. Um, the other components, um, I think, are mostly the steel structure um, that remains. Um, and, uh, so yeah, we, um, we're actually working through the process with DOE now on, um, because we anticipate that the device that we've, we've got deployed now will be useful for the course of the FERC license, it's full 10 years of working through them on the disposition of the equipment, which actually is something that they're not familiar with and have not done much of. So we're working through that process with them. But that is, um, that is uh, something you know, we should probably look into further, but is also kind of part of the um, funding project process as well. But I, I'm glad you brought it up. Cause, uh, I'll Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for making it out this evening. Let's give a big round of applause for Levi and Nathan. Thank you. And yeah, stay tuned for our spring uh, speaker series. We'll be releasing that information shortly.